here we are, the Minor Prophets, Minor Prophets for Beginners, Majoring in Minors, subtitle, this is lesson three, Hosea. We finally, we're finally into the actual prophets themselves, a lot of introductory material, little background stuff that we've done the last couple of lessons. But with this lesson, we begin our study of the Minor Prophet themselves. One point of review that I want to mention here that will be helpful as we study these 12 prophets is the order in which they appear in the Bible is the same as the order they appear in history. And more specifically around three important dates. And I thought maybe we'd just look at that for a moment uh, this morning. Three important time periods where these men were active. The first is the fall of the Northern Kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. We have the prophets Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah uh, connected with uh, that particular date. Uh, the fall of the Southern Kingdom of Judea, 587 BC. Uh, we have Nahum, ha Habakkuk and uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah. And then the third date is the return of the exiles from Babylon to Judea and Jerusalem, those several waves of uh, exiles returning. Remember I told you they didn't, they didn't all come back one day, they all decided to come back. No, they came back in several waves. But the prophets of that era, uh, 538 to 457 BC, Haggai, Zechariah, and the final one is Malachi. Um, as I mentioned, we're not going to be reading each complete book in class. You will be doing this at home to prepare each week. And in class, we're going to review each book by breaking it down into five categories. So we have kind of a system of studying each of these uh, prophets. They're different, their message is different, they lived at different times, but in order to have some continuity, I'm going to look at them from these five perspectives. The prophet himself, some background, whatever background material I can find about the prophet. The prophet's time, the era, what was happening during the time that this prophet was, uh, was alive. Uh, the prophet's message. Uh, not all the books have just one message. They often spoke about different things, but we'll key in on some of the major things that uh, he was talking about. And then uh, the prophet's lessons, not only the lessons and not only the things he was trying to teach the people at the time, but can we draw any lessons for ourselves today? Anything modern we can apply to ourselves? So this is the kind of framework that I'm going to uh, follow uh, as we cover each one of these uh, uh, books. In this way, between your careful reading at home and our review in class, uh, you'll become familiar uh, with these, uh, with these uh, neglected books. Very, very few people choose to uh, read. Uh, you, know, you don't wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm gonna be reading the Minor Prophets today. You know, usually we'll read Romans or Galatians or Matthew or James, you know, we'll read something like that. The Psalms, Proverbs, you know, there's so many other books to, to look at, more comforting, easier to understand. We rarely do uh, the minor prophets were like numbers. No one ever gets up in the morning and says, I believe I'll, I'll read numbers for encouragement today. So uh, uh, the minor prophets fall into that category. So we're going to look at uh, the book of Hosea, begin with that one. The prophet Hosea, he is referred to as Ose, son of Barry, in the Hebrew Bible. When I mention the Hebrew Bible, you know what I'm talking about. What we call the Old Testament, the Jewish people call the Hebrew Bible. They're interchangeable terms. The name Hosea means to save or salvation. Hosea was a citizen of the Northern Kingdom and had a long prophetic ministry from about 750 BC to 722 BC. We don't have a lot of information about his background or his occupation outside of his prophetic ministry. Some prophets we know something about, some others, the only thing we know is they had a calling to ministry and we have their message. Uh, after that, we have to uh, kind of dig around to find out more information about each one. 
However, he does have an unusual calling in that instead of a spoken message, he was to deliver to the people and he did. Uh, more importantly, God called him to live out a situation in his personal life that would reflect or mirror a similar situation that was taking place uh, at the time between God and the people of the Northern Kingdom. So God called uh, Hosea to live out something uh, that reflected uh, the situation in his life would be a reflection of the situation that was taking place between God and the kingdom of, uh, well, the Northern Kingdom. Now the idea of acting out, acting out various scenarios was a common practice among God's province and uh, prophets rather, and servants, just to uh, give you an idea. Uh, Moses, for example, removing his shoes to indicate holy ground. That was acting something out in order to demonstrate a spiritual principle. Uh, Saul, the king, King Saul, uh, he cut up two oxen and he sent the pieces to the tribal leaders as a call to war in 1 Samuel chapter 11 to 17. Again, uh, acting out a particular thing in physical terms in order to make a spiritual, uh, a spiritual point. Uh, Ezekiel uh, ate a scroll uh, to signify him taking in God's word uh, internally. Uh, and then God had Ezekiel shave his beard and cut his hair and then divide the hair into three parts and to do different things with the hair that he had uh, removed from his own head and his own uh, beard. Again, acting out in a physical way, something that had a spiritual uh, dimension. Uh, Isaiah was told to walk barefoot uh, and naked for three years. You know, we always talk about Isaiah, how, how marvelous, uh, how poetic his writings are, but uh, we don't realize that he acted out uh, a certain uh, prophecy for several years. And then even in the New Testament, we have this phenomenon. If you remember, Agabus uh, was a prophet in the New Testament times. And he, uh, he's the one who tied the apostle Paul's belt around his own hands and feet in order to warn Paul that he would be arrested in Jerusalem. He said to uh, Paul, this is what's going to happen to the man that goes to Jerusalem. You know, hands tied, feet tied, even use Paul's own belt to uh, demonstrate that in Acts uh, chapter 21, verse 11. So all these things, uh, you know, acting out uh, various scenarios was a, common, uh, was a common thing among the prophets in the uh, Old Testament and the New. Hosea was called by God to reflect the Northern Kingdom of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. And their unfaithfulness to God was demonstrated by them worshiping various idols and other gods while still calling themselves God's people and offering God uh, worship and prayer and uh, sacrifice. Uh, uh, today we call that syncretism, you know, uh, 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 when we mix religions. It's not that the Jews abandoned God. They stopped going to the temple. They stopped offering sacrifices. They stopped celebrating the feast. It's not that they stopped doing that and then gave themselves over to start worshiping idols. It's that they continue doing those things, going to the temple and offering sacrifices, and they continue to celebrate the, the feasts of Passover and uh, you know, a tabernacle and uh, you know, all, all, the, all the feasts. They continued this religious Jewish life, but at the same time, they took on uh, 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 idols and local uh, gods of the people that lived around them. Remember I mentioned to you that uh, each town and each city had its own local gods. The god Baal, for example, uh, uh, had a version of Baal. Every different city, every different region had a different uh, version of the god Baal. 
And so the Jews, what was taking place in the Northern Kingdom was they continued with their traditional Jewish religious worship, but at the same time, they added all kinds of uh, 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 idolatry uh, uh, privately. And so uh, God is calling Hosea uh, to call this out, to, 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 to denounce this, uh, but he does so in an interesting way. In uh, Hosea chapter one, verse two, it says, uh, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. And so Hosea was to mirror this blatant infidelity uh, of the people with God by purposefully choosing a whore, a harlot is a whore, uh, to be his wife, and then having children with her, knowing that she would repeatedly cheat on him with other men. I mean, it's not, uh, go, go take uh, Susie over there, and uh, it just so happened that Susie, you know, for various reasons, cheated on him because she didn't you know, enjoy his company. No, no. Uh, God tells him, I want you to choose a woman who already is uh, immoral, a harlot, uh, not a prostitute, not a professional, just a woman with loose morals who already has the reputation of sleeping around. I want you to purposely go and choose that woman and make her your wife uh, in order to demonstrate uh, uh, the infidelity that is taking place on a national level with the people of the Northern Kingdom. So he's to act out in his personal life what was happening in the spiritual life of the nation. So as we read on from his initial calling uh, uh, and, and of course his response by taking a woman called Gomer the harlot's name was Gomer, uh, and the name Gomer means to end, to end. So Hosea takes Gomer as wife. God then uses their relationship as a reflection of his own relationship with Israel. So Hosea is like God and his unconditional love, and Gomer is like Israel, a people who continually sinned by their unfaithfulness. So the interesting facet of this acted out prophecy is that God uses the names of their three children that you know, Gomer bears. He uses these children as messages to the people of Israel concerning their conduct and its effect and the consequences that this will eventually uh, produce. So very interesting a uh, very interesting uh, background story to Hosea's uh, life and his sacrifice. Imagine, uh, these are real people. This is, these, these are not myths, these are not fantasies. These are real people. He had to do this very thing. How, how terribly uh, difficult for, uh, for him. Well, let's talk a bit about the prophet's uh, time frame, what, what he was uh, living in. Hosea lived and ministered during the period of the divided kingdom. And as the opening verse explains, his ministry lasted through the reigns of uh, Uzziah, King Uzziah, King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. These were kings of the Southern Kingdom. And uh, he lived and worked uh, during the reign of Jeroboam II who was the king of the Northern Kingdom where he lived and he prophesied. In those days, at that time, who was king in the North and who was king in the South indicated what the time was. So they didn't say in November of you know, uh, 700 BC, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't you know, mark time like that. They would say in the second year of the reign of this king or uh, in, the, in the north or of this king in the south. So that's how we know when uh, uh, Hosea uh, was, um, was ministering. Uh, he ministered during the reign of Jeroboam II, uh, who was the king 
of the Northern Kingdom. His uh, book doesn't mention it, but he was a contemporary of the prophets of the Southern Kingdom, Isaiah and Micah. Always interesting, uh, it's always interesting to note that many of these prophets worked at the same time. Uh, they may have even known each other or known of each other. So uh, Hosea is working in the north, uh, Isaiah and Micah are working uh, in, the, in the south. Uh, during Jeroboam II's reign, the northern kingdom enjoyed great economic prosperity. We always assume that the prophets are speaking to the nations, you know, while times are tough and things are down and you know, the economy's in the pits, you know, and, and, and they're warning them, you know, it's, it's going to get worse if you people don't get better. But this was not the case. During the time of Jeroboam II, the economy uh, were, was great. Uh, the Northern Kingdom was uh, experiencing a period of, of uh, unknown prosperity. Uh, his, his armies were victorious over the Arameans and Jeroboam conquered uh, the city of Damascus and he extended Israel's uh, border uh, further, further north. However, this economic prosperity advantaged only the rich who grew richer, while because of social injustice, the poor remained poor and could not even find relief or redress uh, for their oppression from the courts. And so it's bad enough that the rich were exploiting the poor. That tends to happen you know, uh, in all generations. Uh, it, that's not a Jewish thing. You know, that, that happens in all kinds of countries. But the bigger problem was the poor people, the small people, they could not even appeal to the court system for justice because the court system and the justice system was corrupt in that country in favor of the, uh, the rich and the powerful. Uh, Jeroboam, uh, King Jeroboam uh, rebuilt and fortified the city of Shechem as the capital of the Northern Kingdom and wanting to avoid his people returning to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, which was located in the Southern Kingdom, thus losing their you know, allegiance to the Southern Kingdom, he went ahead and built two state temples with golden calves in each temple located in the cities of, uh, in the cities of Bethel and in the city of Dan. The big problem when the, when the, uh, when the kingdom split after uh, Solomon's death uh, and, and became north and south, the north was much larger, had 10 tribes. The south was much smaller, only the tribe of Judah and the smaller tribe of Dan. But the advantage of the southern kingdom was that the city of Jerusalem was located in the southern kingdom and that's where the temple was, uh, where the worship was, uh, where the legitimate source of their, uh, um, their spiritual life uh, was. And so the kings in the north knew that you know, before long people would start drifting south just to go to the temple and eventually might simply end up returning to the south to live there. So in order to uh, uh, avoid this, uh, the, king, uh, the kings uh, built other temples in the northern territory. And of course they put golden calves there, uh, reminiscent of the time of, uh, of Aaron in the, in the desert. The calf, the golden calf, uh, these were um, um, popular, if you wish, popular symbols uh, for various um, uh, pagan religions uh, at the time. So into this prosperous society with luxurious homes, a vibrant economy and expanding power and military, as well as an expanding population. Uh, in my research, um, I found that the population, uh, I was just curious because uh, it says uh, the North was growing, you know, and I was curious, how many people? You know? So anyways, I, I dug around and, uh, found uh, this information uh, that the estimate of the people during Jeroboam II's reign in the Northern Kingdom, 350,000 people uh, in the Northern Kingdom. Today we figure, well, that's the size of a medium sized town or something, you know, but in those days that was a tremendous, for such a small little country, 
to have 350,000 uh, people just in the Northern Kingdom was a great advantage uh, to them. And so these people, this population, have now abandoned the worship uh, of the true God of Israel, the God of their ancestors, and they have added the pagan gods of their neighbors. The, thing, the very thing that God warned them not to do when they went into the promised land, they went ahead and they did it, and they did it in spades, so to speak. Right? So into this situation, God sends prophets to denounce their materialism, their injustice, and their idolatry. He sends Jonah and Amos, Joel, and the subject of our study today, the prophet Hosea. The prophet's message, well, you know, just pick something, you know, he had so much to choose from. There was no dearth of sermon material. There's plenty of sermon material to go around. But his message was set around the fall of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Hosea's preaching denounces the worship of gods other than the God of the Jews. Uh, Yahweh. Uh, much of Hosea's message is framed as a living metaphor comparing Israel's abandonment of Yahweh to a woman being unfaithful to her husband. So as you're reading it, you know, he's accusing the nation of being unfaithful. Just as a, a woman is unfaithful to her loving husband, uh, the nation, uh, the northern kingdom is being unfaithful to the loving God that has brought them into uh, brought them into uh, being. And so God called on Hosea to live out this situation, as I mentioned, by marrying Gomer, who would bear him children, but would also become unfaithful to him. This is the first time that God's relationship with his people would be referred to as a marriage. A unique thing about Hosea's preaching. Never before had the relationship between God and his people been uh, uh, referred to as a marriage. Hosea is the first of the prophets that talks about this. We see that Hosea seeks out Gomer after their separation uh, and, and a very poignant uh, scene is that he buys her back at a slave market in Hosea 3 verse 2, she's unfaithful. She goes with other men. Uh, she's traded around from man to man. And then eventually no one wants her and, and she's simply sold off as, as property uh, to the slave market where anyone can simply buy her and use her in any way that she wants. This is his wife. This is the mother of his children that he sees in the slave market, in the public market. And uh, he writes about buying her back and bringing her back home to live. Uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, scene of, of uh, love and forgiveness. Um, this time uh, there's a metaphor for the eventual reconciliation between God and his people, which is a sign of hope, the idea of him actually buying her back and bringing her home, again, is a reflection of what God wants to do with his people. He wants to buy them back. He wants to bring them home. He wants to offer them uh, forgiveness. Uh, another feature of Hosea's preaching is the naming of his children. The naming of his children with names that had symbolic meaning, reflecting the relationship between God and Israel. And so each time that Gomer bore a boy or a girl, the name of the child referred to a judgment of God on the people and the judgment grew in severity with each successive child. Uh, uh, for, uh, for example, Jezreel, the first child, Jezreel. So let's read uh, Hosea chapter one. He says, so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of uh, Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel, for yet a little while and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. 
So Jezreel means God sows. God, you know, like a farmer sows seed, God sows. Symbolically, it is a metaphor for actions that were sowed that will reap certain consequences. It is also the name of a valley where many battles were fought and much blood was shed, the Valley of Jezreel. It is also where King Saul died in battle. And in giving this name, uh, God is announcing that he would bring judgment on the house of Jehu, who was a former king who had destroyed several royal families, the, ro the family of Omri and the family of uh, Amaziah and Ahab, in order to secure his own position as king. And if you read through the Old Testament, you find out that you know, if someone ascended as king, one of the first things they would do is get rid of all the, you know, all the relatives of the former king so that no one could have access to the throne. Well, these, uh, these uh, Jehu, the family of Jehu, the, uh, who became king, had done the same thing. And God is saying, I'm going to punish his family for having done uh, this, uh, you know, these murders in order to uh, secure his position as king. So the connection between Jehu and Jezreel is that it was at Jezreel that Jehu killed King Joram uh, and uh, excuse me, Ahaziah and Jezebel and King Ahab's descendants in 2 Kings chapter 9 verses 29. Um, uh, now these were wicked kings, and with the preaching of Elijah, Jehu began a religious reform, but eventually he formed an alliance with Assyria, which uh, was seen as an act of unfaithfulness by not depending entirely on God. And so for this and other sins, God was to bring judgment on this family and these descendants, and if, you haven't, if you're not lost by now, and uh, uh, the child that, uh, you know, that uh, Gomer had, the first boy, called him Jezreel. Well, that name reflected all of these things that had taken place. The Valley of Jezreel, where a lot of murders took place, uh, where uh, King Saul had died. In other words, it, it, it refers to sadness and death and so on and so forth. And so the name Jezreel announces that there's going to be a reckoning, there's going to be punishment, there's going to be death, okay? The next uh, child, uh, after a child being named that, I don't know if I'd want a second one, you know, I'd be afraid, but anyways, they went ahead and had uh, another child called Lo Ruhama, Lo Ruhama. Lo Ruhama means uh, no mercy. Uh, we read in Hosea 1 verse 6, says, then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, name her Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. So no mercy here refers to God's mercy for the people who are in a covenant relationship with him. So God was slow to anger and very patient with his people. Before, with the name Jezreel, he announces the judgment and the punishment of one particular family. Now we read in uh, verse seven, he says, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. Note that there is no judgment on the southern kingdom. Now the intensity increases in that he will no longer have the same attitude of mercy for all the people of the northern kingdom in the covenant with him, not just one family. So the name Jezreel announced a reckoning for a particular family in the northern kingdom. The second child, Lohamani, refers to no mercy. That means now everyone is going to be judged. God is not going to have mercy uh, on, on the entire uh, uh, northern, uh, northern kingdom. And then there's another child, Lo-Ami. Lo-Ami, in Hosea 1, verse 8, 9, it says, when she had weaned uh, Lo-Ruhama, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, name him Lo-Ami, 
for you are not my people and I am not your God. So before God punished his people in many ways, but despite these times, they were still his people. You know, you're my people and I'm going to punish you because you've been unfaithful. That's what I do to my people in order to you know, discipline them. But now, now the worst thing uh, it takes place uh, announced by the name of this third child. Now he says, you're not my people. Before you were my people and I will punish you and discipline you. Now he says, you're not my people. That's like the father in the house with the son who's a troublemaker saying, that's it, out. What do you mean out? Out, pack your bags. You want to do your life? You want to live your life? You know, you know, my house, my rules, you know what I mean? Out, get yourself a job, go find a place to stay, but you're not, in, you're not a member of this family anymore. Well, this is kind of, this is this kind of speech that God is giving to an entire nation. You're not my people anymore, out. I don't want you. And so this time we have the most severe action. God is rejecting the Northern people or the Northern kingdom, excuse me, as his covenant people. You're no longer my covenant people. I'm no longer in a covenant with you. He divorces them, okay? So what is, what is Hosea about, you know, in a, in a, in a big uh, uh, picture? Well, Hosea's book is a very emotional and passionate account of the relationship between God and the Northern Kingdom of Israel. It portrays the unfaithfulness of the people of God and the consequences of these actions. Hosea's own troubled relationship with his wife serves as a metaphor of God's relationship with Israel. Despite Israel's sinful ways, God still pleads with them to repent and return to him because he offers forgiveness and uh, salvation. All right, so that's the, uh, the nature of the book, uh, the key names, the key events that take place. I want to just outline the book now, just a, you know, a straight ahead outline of the book itself. Chapters one to three, the marriage of Hosea and Gomer serves, as I say, as a metaphor for God's relationship with unfaithful Israel. Hosea takes Gomer back after her, her infidelity, just as God promises to take back Israel as his people. In chapters four to seven, these chapters contain a series of accusations against Israel for its sins of idolatry, dishonesty, and social injustice. And so Hosea warns that these actions will bring divine punishment. And it was hard for the people to understand and to accept, why? Because they were in a time of prosperity, that's why. Things were going great, the economy was zooming along, the population was growing, the, the, the military was having success, you know, and all this. And now Hosea comes along and says, nah, -uh. God's not pleased with you. So it's hard for the people, I'm not making excuses for them, I'm just saying, you know, when everything's going, you know, uh, swimmingly, uh, it's hard to hear uh, a message of, uh, of, of discipline, uh, of reproval. Uh, but that's the message that, uh, that he brought, a warning uh, uh, that divine judgment was coming. And then in chapters eight to 10, uh, the people continue to pursue false gods and they refuse to listen to God's calls to repentance. And so Hosea predicts that they will be punished for their, for their sins. He has no good news sermons. His sermons are all you know, bad news because the people refuse uh, to uh, respond. And then in chapters 11 to 14, God's love for his people shines through in these chapters. Despite Israel's sins, God cannot abandon them and promises salvation to those who do repent and turn back to him. And the book ends with a promise of restoration to all those who turn back to God. And that's a kind of a feature in, in uh, almost all the prophets, major prophets and minor prophets. It's like uh, they announce the situation, they preach against it, 
they warn of the punishment that's to come and then they usually finish with, but if you repent, God will take you back and, and we'll have times of refreshment and so on and so forth. Some special features of uh, Hosea's book, a couple of these I want to mention. Uh, first of all, the use of Hosea's family situation as what I call a living metaphor, reflecting God's relationship with Israel. It says, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. So right off the bat, you know exactly you know, what's going to take place uh, in the book. Uh, something else, uh, vivid imagery. Hosea uses passionate, vivid and emotional imagery to express the gravity of Israel's sins and the depths of God's love. For example, uh, we read, come, let us return to the Lord for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Isn't that amazing? He'll raise us up on the third day. Just, just glimmers of messianic uh, prophecy there in uh, Hosea. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn and he will come to us like the rain, uh, like the spring rain watering the earth. Uh, a message of encouragement to those uh, who, um, who repent. A third feature, he talks about social justice. Hosea is one of the first prophets to address the issue of social injustice and call the wealthy and the powerful to account for their exploitation of the poor. It's not all about repenting and, and being faithful religiously. It's not all about that. It's about the day-to-day -day life of the people and how they treat uh, one another. So uh, we, we read a little passage here in uh, Hosea 12. It says, therefore return to your God, observe kindness and justice, and wait for your God continually, a merchant in whose hands are false balances he loves uh, to oppress. And Ephraim said, surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors, they will find in me no iniquity, which would be sin. Hosea 12 verse eight. The idea is that the people here are answering the accusation that they're not being fair, that there's social injustice. And he's saying, and Ephraim, Ephraim is a reference to the Northern Kingdom. Uh, is saying, surely I've become, you know, I've got money, I've got, you know, what's the problem? Everything is going good, you know, I've found wealth for myself in all my labors they will find in me, I, I've not done anything wrong. I'm not hurting anybody, I'm minding my own business, things are going great, what's the problem? You know, same, the echo of the same attitude that we find in, in every generation. Um, another feature, uh, memorable lines. Hosea's book contains some of the most memorable lines in the Old Testament. Verse six, it says, for I delight, here he's talking about God, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Uh, didn't Samuel say something like that uh, as well? God prefers what? Obedience over sacrifice. Hosea uh, reflects the same, same idea about God. Yes, uh, worship is important. Yes, it's important that we are involved in that, but he's, in, he's interested in justice and mercy uh, uh, more than he is in um, uh, correctness of um, uh, our approach to, uh, to worship. And then it's organized around themes and ideas. His book is uh, organized around themes and ideas. The, the book structure is not linear it's not um, chronological, but rather it's organized around themes and ideas which make it more difficult to outline and follow. For example, he talks about spiritual adultery and God's love and mercy and the consequences of sin and, and God's view of injustice. It's not a narrative. It's not, 
he went here, he did this, then this happened, and this happened, and uh, then two days later this happened, and then Hosea answered, you know, it's not like that. He, ta he, he talks about different themes uh, and, and the meaning of these things um, insofar as what's taking place in the kingdom at the time. Um, the prophet's message, lessons, okay? Lessons that we can, that we can uh, learn. Uh, God is a God of both justice and mercy. In our society, people always seeing God as a God of mercy, always, God, God wouldn't do that. You know, it's an old story, God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't hurt me, he wouldn't punish me, he wouldn't judge me, you know, because why? Because he's a God of mercy, well, yes. But he's a God of both justice and mercy. I'm happy he's a God of justice because, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 guy who, the guy who has his uh, uh, fifth the DUI, uh, and while he's uh, having his fifth DUI, uh, runs over his, uh, a mom and her two kids, you know, and kills them all, you know what I'm saying? And this is the fifth time he's been arrested for DUI. I'm glad there's justice. I think of uh, Hitler, let's do an easy one. I think of Hitler, you know, I'm glad there's justice. Uh, I think of some dictators uh, in the modern age in the last hundred years been responsible for the death of millions of people suffering, incredible suffering, you know. I'm glad there's justice, are you kidding me? Of course. And so Hosea, you know, emphasizes the idea that God is both a God of justice and mercy. Couple of lessons here uh, for us that we can, uh, that we can uh, take for today. Lesson number one, remain faithful. I mean, remain faithful. God has and will always punish infidelity and he will reward those who remain faithful. Not those who remain perfect, those who remain faithful. I, I like uh, Marty, have to give Marty a, uh, credit for this line, but boy, it, it just hits the nail right on the head. In one of his sermons at one time, he says, you know what, I'm not a perfect husband, but I'm a faithful husband. I mean, doesn't that say it all? Doesn't all those of us who've been married for a long time, I'm not a perfect husband or wife, I'm not perfect, but I am faithful, I can be faithful, I can do that. Well, that's what God is looking for. He's not looking for perfection, uh, he's looking for faithfulness. He's dealt with perfection. The cross is what deals with perfection. He asks us for what we can give him. We can't give him perfection, but we can give him faithfulness. We can do that. And, and uh, Hosea uh, uh, emphasizes this idea, the importance of it. Another lesson, again, God is love. We see God's love in the creation and in the many blessings that he provides for us each and every day. However, the greatest example of his love is his willingness to forgive on the most egregious sins, the worst things that we've ever done, things that we've thought and done that we're even ashamed to speak of. Uh, he, for, he forgives us, he's willing to forgive the people. After the miracles and the blessings given to the Jews by God, they abandoned him to worship gods of wood and stone, and yet God was prepared to forgive and bless them again. In the same way that uh, uh, Hosea was willing to go to the slave market after his wife has, have, has been used by countless, who knows how many strangers, and he's, he takes her back and he takes her back. And if you read uh, you know, that passage, he takes her back and he doesn't say, I'm taking you back and I'm, uh, in order to slap you around and you know, take punishment. No, he takes her back and he encourages her to be faithful and to be the wife that he wants her to be. And you know, he never gives up hope, a marvelous lesson. Uh, God is love, you know. he takes us back. Another lesson. Our faith is demonstrated most clearly in the way that we treat other people. Again, the people of Hosea's day thought that keeping the ritual laws of sacrifice at the temple fulfilled their duty to God in full and how they treated others had no bearing on their relationship with God. 
You think our faith, our religion, you know, our uh, uh, duties uh, are burdensome? You know, that we come to church on Sundays, you know, on the Lord's Day, we come take communion. Uh, some of us come back Sunday night for another lesson. Uh, many come on Wednesday as well. Some of you crazy people come here even on Wednesday morning, you know, but we think that's burdensome. Boy, you want to see burden. Try being a Jew and all of the intricate preparations required you know, to offer sacrifice and, and continually to maintain ceremonial uh, 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 cleanliness and purity so that, you'd, so that you'd have a right to bring a sacrifice. Uh, the requirements of the Jewish law was so burdensome. And so it, it got them to the point where they were thinking, it's so hard to just do my religious thing I can just do anything I want in other areas. And Hosea was saying, uh, all that work you're putting in to worship God in the proper way doesn't count for anything if you don't treat your neighbor properly. So the point is that unfaithfulness or disobedience to God's word or will cannot be covered over or replaced by mere ritual. You can't trade one for the, for the other. In context, Hosea's message is that mistreatment of others, which goes against God's will and word, cannot be covered over by religious observances or uh, rituals. In other words, your prayers, your praise, your worship is acceptable to God insofar as your treatment of other people is acceptable to him as well. Not one or the other, you gotta, have, you gotta have both. A New Testament version of this uh, third idea here, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I've heard so many lessons on what distinguishes us as a church, you know, the true church, the church of Christ, you know, and uh, well, we don't use instruments and we don't do this and you know, uh, uh, the, we have male spiritual leadership and we're organized in a certain way, you know, and all of that is true. I'm not denying, of course that's true, but Jesus himself doesn't give any of those details. He says, if you want to be known as my disciples, people will know that by how you treat each other. I mean, let's face it, kind of uh, boils it down to its uh, essential, uh, essential truth. All right, the surest proof of your claim to be a disciple of Jesus is the love that you have for other disciples. And sometimes it's not easy to love other disciples. Um, I, I, I say this uh, simply from experience. The people outside the church do not have the ability to hurt my feelings as much as the people inside the church do. And in my experience, I've been hurt way more by brothers and sisters than I have by people out in the world. People out in the world, you know, it's like, I don't expect much from them. They're in the world, they're unbelievers. I don't expect much from them. But the brothers and sisters in the church, I expect a lot from them. And boy, when they hurt you, it really hurts. All right, assignment. Now that we've kind of talked about this and I've given you some background, I encourage you to go back and read Hosea over again, hopefully this time it'll come to life a little more. You'll get you know, three dimensional or two dimensional look at it. And while you're at it, read the book of Joel and Amos, because our next lesson we're going to do two of the prophets. All right, that's our lesson for today. Thank you for your attention, appreciate it. We'll see you next time.